Rocket Ranger Red 64, and welcome back to another League of Legends lore reading video. Today, we will be continuing reading The Lost Tales of Orn by Matt Dunn. Chapter 3 Three Sisters Ask Orn for Help. Once there were three sisters who needed Orn's help in saving their world. Orn, however, did not care to help anyone save any world anywhere. It was for personal reasons, and he did not elaborate on the matter. But this did not stop the three sisters journeying many days and nights to ask. There are creatures of great and wicked magic that haunt their tribes. And first sister said, She had fierceness and war in her eyes. They want to destroy all things claim the world for themselves. This sounds like a problem, Orn said. He did not look up from forging. Then will you fight with us and use your strength to slay the monsters? Orn grunted. This grunt meant no in such a way as to halt any more decisions. This was understood by all. You heard his grunt. You would have thought the first sister wise for not pressing the matter further. These brings watch our every move, the second sister said. There was hope and wisdom in her voice. I would ask you to take the spade that once dug your mighty river and use it to dig the deepest trench in all the world. Then we can lure the monsters into a pit ourselves and solve your own problem. Orn grunted. The sound of this grunt meant I will dig that hole and that everyone should stop talking immediately. This was understood by all. If you heard this grunt, you would have thought the second sister wise for not pressing the matter further. Orn dug them a trench for a very deep hole add much to a landscape. Also, he had planned on digging on anyway in the end. The proposed location was a fine spot. Or was finished with the trench. He left the three sisters with a nary word, for he had already said far too much for them. That is one deep hole, the second sister said. I prayed that it is deep enough. Wind blew up from the freshly dug abyss with an underworldly hollow, as if to say that it was deep enough. If you had heard the abyss howl, you would have thought it wise that no one climbed down to measure its depth. Several years later, the sisters returned. They looked as if the battles with their foes had taken a toll. This time, the third sister spoke. Her icy breath reminded Orn of the cold and dry days long ago. Orn, builder of all things, she began. I did not build all things, he grumbled. Again, he did not look up from his forging. Just some of them I have built. This third sister continued. We come now to ask you one simple favor. The pit you dug is so deep and so wide that we cannot build even a single bridge across it. Teach me how to build a bridge that can never break, and I will do the work myself. Orn raised an eyebrow. He studied the third sister's eyes. He did not trust her, for she had a scent of magic about her, and magic always makes sturdy things weaker. There are many able bridge builders. Go and bother them. Do not bother me again. The elder builders cannot make a bridge with the type of stone we have, the third sister replied. They claim it fell from the sky, and they cannot forge it for all their efforts. She then presented the trunk of the star metal. If you had seen the star metal, you think it wise that only Orn could possibly ever shape its material. 
for it was almost as stubborn and unyielding as him. Orin agreed, but he would do the work alone and required the star medal itself as payment. The third sister gave it to him, and he used it to forge a tool to help build the bridge. With that tool, and with that only tool, Orn built the bridge. The second sister felt bad about the third sister's lie, for they did not need a bridge at all. She asked Orn what sort of tool it was. I used it to hammer said. Oh, I will call it Hammer. I've said enough. When he was out of sight, the third sister walked the length of the bridge, reciting strange incantations across the entire span. This turned the bridge into a crossbar that sealed the beast below within the abyss. However, Orin had been right, and the addition of magic ruined the quality of his work. Had the three sisters left it well enough alone, it would have lasted forever. Instead, the enchantment would slowly eat away at the masonry. It would take ages, though, so nobody paid much mind or attention, and the three sisters vowed to never speak of Orn again. Orn, meanwhile, realized he did not like people asking him favors, and threw his spade as far to the west as he could. Where it landed, no one ever knows, and it is faint, is lost to darkness. Then he returned east and threw his favorite eating fork as far as he could. It landed somewhere in the Great Sea. Some say later a mere king found a powerful trident at the sea bottom and still uses it to rule his kingdom. Orn was ready to throw his hammer into the night sky but he could not bear to do it, and decided to keep it. Were you to see Orn and ask him if it is his favorite tool, he would have scolded you for thinking like a child. But in secret, he favors Hammer above all other things he has ever made. Dawn brings the plump berries and the meatiest fish, I say to the children. We need to be rested. They groan in unison and plead with me for one more story. Just one more story. There is only one more story left about Orn. I tell them. We should save it for another night. Only when they pledge to do every chore and not to complain about it, I do it without any hesitation. Chapter 4 the Troll and the Ram Door Everyone knows that you never challenge a troll to a drinking contest, don't they? Even you little ones know not to make a bet with a troll, for trolls are sneaky and will always win. Also, everyone in the Freljord knows that the uglier a troll is, the luckier and more cunning it can be. Unfortunately, Orn did not know any of these things. Grudge Grack the Hideous was the oldest troll kin in the world. His chest hair was so long it got tangled up in his gnarled toes. Ugh. He would have often tripped over it and break his break his nose even, which was bulbous and mishappened from being broken so many times. He only had two good teeth, one bad eye and one worst eye. Warts and pimples covered his routed belly. I will not tell you how he smelled. If I did, he would never eat fermented fish stew again. Build me a door that will keep my treasure safe from thieves forever, Grudge Grack said to Orn outside Hearth Home and I will give you ten casks of my troll men. It's a family recipe. Orn dismissed his guests, but Grudge Gak struck out his foot to stop the door from closing in. Orn did not want the troll's bunion-covered toes ruining the paint 
So he let the creature go on. Let us make a wager, said the truly unbeautiful troll. Whoever can finish a cask of troll meat first owes other adept. If it will take you to make you go away, Orn had never been beaten in a drink contest before. Everyone knew this back then, and now you do too. At least it will be a good to have a drink, Rob Rack replied, and his smile warped one of the Earthworm's pillars. While Orn's back was turned, Troll slipped a shard of true ice into a cask and handled it to his chanager. They toasted in the jovial manner of the frail yord and drank. Orn found the troll meat watered down, and he did not like it. However, Rubrak was halfway through his cask. With his own cask still almost at the brim, Orn tipped his head back a bit further and drank until he thought he would drown. But Grubrak slammed his empty cask down and belched, and the fire in the oven turned a sickly green. Orn coughed and spluttered. What is wrong? Grubrak teased him. Are you choking? Then Orn noticed the true ice in his drink. It was perpetually melting and watering down the troll meat. No matter how much he chugged, the true ice had replaced it. He smashed the cask with one hand. You cheated, Orn said. His angry voice set off an earthquake that sunk a few islands. Of course! What other advantage would an ugly troll like me have against the mighty Orn? In truth, the ugliest troll almost had all the advantages in the world, but Orn did not spend much time with ugly trolls, so he wouldn't know that, but now all of you little ones do. A deal is a deal, Grubrak reminded him. My word is as good as Hammer, Orn grumbled, even if I was cheated. So Orn labored for ten days and built the single best door anyone had ever built. He adorned it with a ram's head like his own, and the one at the heart of the Freljord. It was impervious to magic and lock pickers alike. Grubrak was so impressed with the quality of the door that he was speechless, which is very rare for a troll, if I may add. Orn fastened the door in front of the troll's cave, which was on top of the troll's mountain, and where the ugliest troll kin in history had ever hit their treasure. With a grunt, Orn ruddled off, leaving Grubrak admiring his new door. When he had regained his wits, Grubrak realized it had been a day since he had counted his gold, and he was growing anxious. But he could not find no way to open the door. Not at all. Grubrak tried brute force. The ram-faced door did not budge. Then he tried to strip the paint with his foul breath. Again, the door did not budge. Lastly, he tried to pry the hinges from the cave wall open, but alas, the door was fixed to the mountain so firmly that the troll only hurt his shoulders trying to shake it loose. He was locked out. Gobrak stormed into Orange's forge. What trickery is this? He shouted. His breath was so bad, the forge fire nearly flickered out. There is no trickery. You told me to build a door that would keep your treasure safe from thieves forever. And I did. This door will stand stronger and longer than the mountain as it is on. No one can ever break it. I made it just as you asked. But I cannot get inside, Grubrak cried, and I stole nothing from you. Time is more valuable than gold, my f dear troll, Orn said. So you are a thief. 
then my work is good as my word. Rubrak tried for years to get back inside for his treasure, but the door never opened for him, and he could not even find the keyhole. With each attempt, the rammed head door started back at him. An eternal reminder of one time he cheated Orn. And if you listen carefully up the mountains, you can hear greedy old Grumrak's wails of anguish before any avalanche. Even to this day, the children were fast asleep and snuggled each other around a fire. I carry them one by one to the orphan's tent. Our tribe has a much to share, but we are not the Winter's Claw. The last child is still awake by the fire. He lies on his side. Those stories aren't real, he said in the timeless voice. It's the legless boy. We found him half dead after our own village had been raided. We couldn't leave him. I couldn't leave him, so I wrapped his wounds in bandages and carried them on my shoulders. I think they are made up or changed to help us go to sleep. The story is as real as we believe it is, I tell him as I settle down next to him. There is a god who is good, but he doesn't care about us. I nod slowly. I can see why you would think that, but it is not true. There is one more story I can tell you. It was the last story my grandmother told me before I blossomed to a womanhood. She wanted me to be ready, for it is not like the others. But I think you have seen enough to be ready. What do you think? The boy nods. I draw him close, and I begin. Chapter 5 The Tragedy of the Hurt Blood once, long before the splintering of the Freljord, Orn had a legion of smiths who lived at the base of his mountain. They claimed to worship Orn, but if you were to ask him, they were misguided. For he would say he had no followers. Still, it is true that they built themselves a little town and that it was filled with folk who wished make the finest things in all of the world. There were thousands of them. They made tools. They made plows. They made carts. They made of armor and saddles. They built furnaces and homes. They called themselves the Hearthblood, for they never felt the bidding cold of the Freljord, and could tolerate the immense heat bubbling beneath their bare feet on the slopes of Hearth Home. They became the finest craftspeople in the world of Runeterra, and their worksmanship was surpassed in quality only by Orns. Occasionally, he would appraise their work. If he liked one of the Hearthbloods had wrought, he simply said, Passable. This was a mighty compliment from Orn, who had learned long ago to not speak good of work. Instead, let the work speak for itself. Not remember that tale? I hope you do. Orn never admitted that he admired the hearth blood, but deep inside his chest, his volcanic heart churned with respect for the hard-working people. They did not kneel or offer him a sacrifice of flesh. They did not turn his words into scriptures and spread them across the land to people who did not want to hear them. Instead, they focus on their work in silence. They were imaginative, resourceful, and hardworking. These hearthblood folk made Orn smile, although nobody knew because they couldn't see the smile underneath his mighty beard. One day, the Volibear came to visit his brother Orn. This was no friendly stop, for Orn and his brother were never friendly, nor had ever visited one another before. The great bear was going to make war and needed weapons for his army. Orn saw the army, fierce aberrations, men twisted into their other shapes by 
their efforts to please the volley bear, they were simple and fierce and quick to anger. Give them swords and axes, volley bear demanded. Wicked intent. Give them armor, and I will make it worth your while. Go, oh, said Orin, for he wanted no part of it. Fine, said Volibear. Have your followers do it instead. I do not care. Do this. I am your brother. This irked Orin so much that his great horns flared with molten heat. The people in the town below do not follow me. They build for themselves. They are quiet and work hard. That's all. But Volibear saw beneath his brother's words to the fiery heart in his chest. For all his flaws, Volibear was good at reading others. They are a reflection of your own image. Horn's horns grew red hot and then white hot. I see you again, Volley Bear. I will beat you within an inch of your life. He growled. If you had heard this fret, you would think it wise for Volley Bear to leave and never return. But the Volley Bear loved fighting, and he was not wise. So he took a piece of armor from the walls towards his forge. If you will not make me what I want, then I will take it. With that, Horn charged at the volley bear and smashed him with his horns. It was so powerful, the summit of the mountain shook. This was exactly what the volley bear wanted. For centuries, he had grown jealous of the love the Hearthblood freely gave to his brother. It enraged the war bear. They fought for eight days. They fought so hard the base of the mountain trembled. So fierce was their fighting that molten stone exploded from the peak of Hearth Home. Lightning strikes barraged the mountainside, and jeers of flame gushed from the cliffs. The skies grew black and red. The blood of the world ran through the highlands as the ground shook. People all over the Freljord saw the results of the battle between the Volibear and his brother Orn. When the smoke cleared, the mountain had lost its peak. But worse, the Hearthblood were all dead. Their town was nothing but smoldering ruins and a fading memory. For many centuries, the half mountain once called Hearth Home has stood silent. Every now and then, a plume of smoke rises from the crater where the peak once stood. Some say it is Orn, lightning, his fearness to keep the fires under the surface of the world from going out. Others say he is building a great weapon that he will pay each one. And there are others still who believe Orn was killed by Volibear, for he has not been seen in the Freljord since. And so, Orn's name and tales have been lost to time and written out of the histories. These few stories passed on around our meals of roasted fish are all that were made on one. That is a sad tale, which means it is the truest the legless boy said. What do you believe happened to Orn? I believe when the great builder and the lost forge god of the Freljord returns, it will be to remake the world. I would like to see that one day. Maybe you will. Do not weep for the Hearthblood. Weep instead for the stories lost to war and time. For once, they were more numerous than the stars. Repeat these tales so your children's children can still hear our ancestors' voices and stoke the fire of the forge in our hearts. In my heart, I can feel my grandmother's smile. It warms me. I feel 
no cold beneath my bare feet. For I wish to see in my lifetime for the forge god to return 